Well said. Okay, so um, my name is uh, Dr. Omar Janeth, and I'm from Pakistan, and I'll be talking about um, early onset Parkinson's disease. Um, so uh, this topic uh, was, um, I, I found particularly interesting because in the rotation, we had a patient who came in and uh, he was diagnosed with uh, early onset Parkinson's disease. And um, unlike the patients that I've seen in the hospital who are mostly above 50 when they're diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease, this patient was very relatively very young. He was uh, in his late 30s, I think. So um, because of that, I uh, researched on this topic and I um, found this topic interesting. And so I made a presentation. So the contents of my presentation will include a definition of what Parkinsonism and early onset Parkinsonism is, types, history, pathophysiology, etiology, epidemiology, clinical presentation, diagnosis, and treatment. So to define what Parkinsonism is, Parkinsonism is a clinical syndrome presenting with any combination of bradykinesia, rest tremor, um, rigidity, and postural instability. The most common form of Parkinsonism is Parkinson's disease. We will later discuss how this one is also called as idiopathic Parkinsonism. Um, so young onset Parkinson's disease or early onset Parkinson's disease is a variant of Parkinson's disease when the disease occurs before 40, sometimes 50 years of age. So there is varying literature as to what the exact uh, cutoff for the age is, but many um, studies agree that it's uh, before 40. So, um, so we can talk a bit about the different types of Parkinsonism. I mentioned before that Parkinsonism um, is basically a set of symptoms uh, that present in a, a certain way. So you have idiopathic, uh, which is also called as Parkinson's disease. You have vascular and you have drug induced. So vascular um, is uh, has been documented as uh, the type of Parkinsonism where you have some level of atherosclerotic disease, which um, results in ischemia to the brain and it results in multiple uh, areas of infarcts and that eventually leads to Parkinson's like symptoms. So then you have drug induced Parkinson's. Um, we will later discuss the exact mechanism of how Parkinson's disease is caused. But to give you an idea, Parkinson's disease occurs because there's a, a lack of dopamine um, from in the substantia nigra. So if you have any sort of drug that is causing a decreased level of dopamine or an inactivation of the dopamine receptors, you will get drug induced Parkinsonism. Uh, another um, variant to this is uh, uh, Parkinsonism caused by MPTP, but usually drugs like um, antipsychotics and antidepressants can of often lead to drug-induced Parkinsonism. Other types uh, include, uh, other causes for Parkinsonism could include um, multiple system um, atrophy and PSP tremors, especially essential tremor, essential tremor as well as um, copper metabolism defect, which is called as Wilson's disease. So let's talk a bit about the history of the disease. The history of the disease is such that it was known to uh, humankind since ancient times. It were referred to as uh, Kampafta in the Indian medical system, where Kampa means uh, tremor or shaking in Sanskrit. It was first mentioned in Western medical texts as shaking palsy by the physician Gallen in 175 AD. Um, however, it was properly described by Dr. James Parkinson back in 1817 uh, through his famous um, essay called An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Later, uh, researchers um, have made uh, breakthroughs and strides in the research in Parkinson's and Gower and Charcot are uh, two such people and they um, help define the many symptoms uh, that you will have in a clinical, uh, clinical symptoms that you will have in Parkinson's disease. The pathophysiology of Parkinson's is um, through two uh, established mechanisms. One is the misfolding of alpha cytonuclein, which results in the formation and subsequent aggregation of Lewy bodies. The chance of this happening increases with age. The other documented process is the loss of pigmented dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, pars compacta, particularly in the ventral lateral region. Around 60 to 80 percent of dopaminergic neurons are lost before motor signs persevere. Motor circuits of the basal ganglia are disturbed. This results in an inability to refine, modulate, and initiate movement. And in the picture on the right, you can see um, uh, Lewy bodies which are present, and it is one of the um, common features that you will find in Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. So um, uh, to explain this a bit further, let's talk a bit about um, direct versus indirect pathways. Um, so. Direct pathways uh, and indirect pathways are pathways of the basal ganglia where um, uh, inputs and outputs to the cortex are uh, refined and modulated. So you can have um, refined movement. 
of uh, refined movement taking place. So in the direct pathway, uh, you have input from the cortex, which goes to the striatum and um, the chordate. Uh, so, so you have the striatum and the striatum basically sends a carbergic um, signals to the GPI and the substantia nigra, which further sends um, GAB, uh, GABA or inhibitory signals to the thalamus. And the thalamus is the one that sends uh, stimulatory signals to the cortex. So in the direct pathway, um, you have activation of the striatum. It will um, inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Globus pallidus internus is responsible for inhibiting the thalamus. But the thalamus will be disinhibited in this case, and this the cortex will be activated. Um, similarly, in the indirect pathway, you have an overall decreased movement, unlike the direct pathway, which you have an overall increase of movement. So in the indirect pathway, um, you have uh, signals uh, from the striatum to the globus pallidus externus, which is inhibited. So it is unable to inhibit the sub uh, subthalamic nucleus, which sends glutamate or excitatory signals to the globus pallidus internus, which uh, enables it to release um, GABA. And this GABA acts on thalamus and uh, results in its inhibition, thus resulting in inhibition of the cortex as well. So, um, both of these pathways are modulated by the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra will release uh, dopamine via the D1 pathway in the direct pathway and D2 in the indirect pathway. Both of these will result in an overall increase in movement or it will result in activation of the direct and inhibition of the indirect pathway, overall resulting in an increase in movement. What happens in Parkinson's disease is that um, both of these uh, pathways are affected and um, dopamine is uh, dopamine production is decreased. As a result, dopamine is unable to modulate these pathways and you overall get um, bradykinesia or akinesia. So let's talk about the etiology. The etiology of Parkinson's disease is multifactorial. It is linked to both genetic and environmental factors. Young onset Parkinson's disease is significantly associated with various genetic factors. Um, Andreas Bushman et al. found that deletions of a region on chromosome 22 were associated with early onset Parkinson's disease in a 2017 study. A genetic analysis of a Spanish population with EOPD by Tijara um, Perardo Cristina et al. identified the genes PARC2 and LRRK2 to have a significant association with EOPD. Talking about the environmental factors that increase risk of EOPD and PD include pesticides, herbicides, well water, and close vicinity to industrial plants. In a meta-analysis of around 89 studies, including 86 case control studies, Gianni Pizzoli et al. showed that exposure to pesticides leads to 80% increase in a risk for um, Parkinson's disease. MPTP exposure, oxidation theory, melanoma, and diabetes mellitus are some other theories. Um, MPTP exposure, uh, to talk a bit about MPTP, MPTP basically causes um, an inhibition of the oxidatory respiratory chains in the mitochondria. This eventually it has been hypo hypothesized to lead to um, Parkinson's disease. Oxidation theory, on the other hand, basically relies on this principle that dopamine uh, metabolism uh, occurs via the uh, MOA pathway, monoamine oxidase. And uh, monoamine, uh, so this uh, MOA pathway uh, results in degradation of dopamine into um, radicals, especially hydrogen peroxide radicals. Hydrogen peroxide radicals are redu uh, removed via the glutathione, via glutathione. However, if there's a, a decrease of in glutathione or um, glutathione is uh, not able to remove hydrogen peroxide. It results in buildup of these oxygen uh, of these radicals, and these eventually lead to damage that results in Parkinson's disease. Um, melanoma and diabetes mellitus are also long-term complications, and they um, result in Parkinson's disease through various established pathways. So let's talk a bit about early versus late onset Parkinson's. Early onset Parkinson's differs from late onset due to the early establishment of full-blown Parkinson's, diminishing therapeutic effects of both of L-DOPA. Um, this was shown by a cohort study, which was conducted by P. Giovanni uh, on around 120 patients affected by idiopathic early onset Parkinson's. Uh, the study also postulated that early onset disease uh, is a pure form of extrapyramidal defect with primarily motor symptoms. Recent literature has shown that EOPD um, has a longer preclinical stage, but a more severe form of disease. A clinical pathological study on autopsy confirmed cases conducted by Leslie Wayne uh, Figerson et al. identified a slower prog progression, but worse clinical picture in EOPD cases. 
So I'm um, talking a bit about uh, the epidemiology. According to um, more recent studies, Parkinson's disease, the second most common neurodegenerative uh, degenerative disease after Alzheimer's, with around 14 per 100,000 people in the total population and 160 per 100,000 people, uh, 65 or older. Uh, Parkinson's disease affects one to two per thousand of the population, affecting 1% of the population over 60. Around 10 to 20% diagnosed with Parkinson's are under 50. Half of these are diagnosed under 40. Three to five percent of all Parkinson's patients have uh, onset before 40 years, and this is as high as 10 percent in Japan. Approximately 60,000 cases of Parkinson's diagnosed each year in the U.S., of which 6,000 to 12,000 are young patients. Let's um, show this through uh, some graphs. So, as you can see, as the age increases, um, you have an increased chance of getting Parkinson's disease. So the onset is uh, around 39. Um, in uh, early onset uh, Parkinson's patients increases as the age increases with um, a, a steep increase observed after 60 years of age. Along with this, on the right is a graph that shows you um, the prevalence of, uh, or sorry, the incidence of uh, Parkinson's disease as the years um, have progressed. And there has been an overall increase in the number of Parkinson's patients. Um, this could also be attributed to the increased number of diagnoses uh, due to increased awareness for Parkinson's that have, hap uh, that have been happening ever since it was first discovered. The epidemiology of Parkinson's uh, in gender, uh, as in the context of gender, is such that there is a um, slightly higher ratio of males um, being diagnosed with Parkinson's as opposed to females. However, um, note that different studies in different um, populations across the globe have shown very, uh, some level of variability in these statistics as far as gender is concerned. So um, I would like to compare some presentations of uh, late onset versus early onset Parkinson's disease because this is one of the factors that um, sort of uh, differentiate the two diseases. Um, late onset Parkinson's uh, presents with motor symptoms, usually uh, present earlier in Parkinson's and follow the mnemonic trap, which stands for tremor, rigidity, echinacea, and postural instability. Onset is usually asymmetric motor symptoms, particularly an asymmetric resting tremor in around 70% of patients in an upper limb extremity. Bradykinesia, shuffling gait, and rigidity develop subsequently with variable incidence and pattern. Stride becomes shorter and posture flexed. Non-motor symptoms preceding motor ones can occur and usually include REM behavior disorder, varying degrees of anosmia. And a study conducted by um, TNK who uh, et al conducted on around 159 patients with recently diagnosed Parkinson's showed there was a higher frequency of non-motor symptoms as compared to a control of 99 healthy age match patients. In the latter study, the most commonly found symptoms were hypersalivation, hyposmia, constipation, and forgetfulness. Now, this is the prevalence of non-motor symptoms in this particular variant of the disease. Um, if you compare it with early onset uh, Parkinson's disease, um, it has a few distinct characteristics. Um, some of them include dystonias, dyskinesias, and motor complications. The most common one that will present in this age group would be um, dystonias primarily, and then other symptoms would, uh, will develop from that. Also note that early onset Parkinson's disease has been shown by multiple studies to be um, of a purely motor form, uh, and non-motor symptoms, if they develop, develop much later. These motor symptoms can be very severe and very violent and often disabling. Dystonia is the most commonly prevalent motor symptom, sometimes presenting as exercise-induced paroxysmal dystonia, followed by full-blown Parkinsonism. Cognitive dysfunction usually develops late. Slower progression of motor symptoms and disease, but two times higher mortality rates than normal. So um, talking about the stages of Parkinson's disease, um, we have um, early stage Parkinson's disease, which includes mild uh, symptoms and we have mid stage which includes moderate and advanced which includes severe symptoms so um, mild symptoms would begin with tremor of one hand rigidity clumsy leg loss of facial expression on both sides decreased blink blinking speech abnormalities this will progress to moderate symptoms and this will include um, compromise of balance inability to make rapid auto uh, automatic and involuntary adjustments and then further progress uh, to the patients being unable to stand or walk while uh, unassisted and um, often even being noticeably incapacitated with often um, activities of uh, daily living or activities of independent daily living being affected. And the most severe stage will have um, patients um, fall when standing or turning, and they may freeze or stumble when walking and may suffer from uh, symptoms like hallucinations or delusions, which present in very late stage Parkinson's. 
So diagnosis um, for Parkinson's is mostly clinical and um, that's how most clinicians um, would diagnose both uh, variants of this disease. There are no particular lab markers for the disease. CTI MRIs are mostly unremarkable and PET and SPECT may show positive findings. Um, no laboratory or imaging study is required with a typical presentation. Patients without tremor should be considered for MRI evaluation to rule out brain lesions such as tumor, stroke, or demyelination. In patients with an unusual presentation, tests may include serum uh, cellular plasma and sphincter electromyography or lumbar puncture. So um, I wanted to show um, how a PET scan for Parkinson's disease would look like as compared to one uh, in a normal person or in a healthy person. So there are two main uh, markers that you, there are many markers actually available, uh, which are basically radioisotopes or um, uh, radioisotopes that emit uh, uh, radioactive waves and thus you can pick them up. Um, there are two main radioactive substances that um, are worth mentioning. One is um, F-DOPA, which is often used. It is a basically a precursor to uh, dopamine and thus you can check how, okay, so, um, so um, as I was uh, saying, uh, you have uh, PET tests that have been proven useful in diagnosing and uh, not diagnosing, but basically having positive findings in Parkinson's disease. So um, in Parkinson's disease, uh, the PET um, uses different radioisotopes, which uh, will show on the PET and will be different from a normal person or a healthy person. So the, the idea is that this um, substance or substrate will be related to dopamine or dopamine receptors and the amount of activity will be decreased in Parkinson's disease. So you have two main um, uh, uh, markers among others that are often used, but two of, uh, two, uh, of the ones that are relevant and are often used are DOPA, uh, F-DOPA and CFT. So F-DOPA um, is basically a, a, um, a precursor to um, a dopamine. So F-DOPA uptake, uh, -DOPA uptake by the brain um, will be decreased in Parkinson's disease because you have decreased dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So as you can see in the left picture in Parkinson's disease, there's a very, very diffuse decreased um, uptake of DOPA as compared to a healthy volunteer, which has um, uh, uh, areas where you can see there's increased dopamine uptake. In CFT, it is a substance that um, acts on dopamine receptors and um, activating dopamine receptors. Um, it uh, will, uh, since dopamine itself is decreased and dopamine production is decreased and dopaminergic neurons are decreased in, substantia, uh, in the substantia nigra, CFT um, activation of dopaminergic neurons will also be decreased. And thus you can see this that on the left, um, CFT is decreased and on the right in a healthy volunteer, it is normal or it is increased. So the, the diagnosis, as I was mentioning, um, is mostly clinical. In, or in young onset patients, you will um, go for cellular plasma levels, among other um, metabolic studies, to rule out other causes of ne uh, neurological disease, such as Wilson's disease. If cellular plasma level is low, you can also go for um, urinary copper excretion and slit lab examination to uh, observe for Kaiser Fleischer rings. The International Parkinson and Movement uh, Disorder Society gave us a three-step process which outlined criteria and the helpment of, uh, in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. These include um, supportive criteria, red flags, as well as exclusion criteria. When the supportive criteria are there and the exclusion criteria are absent, along with red flags, which are balanced by the supportive features, um, you can go for a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. This guideline is helpful and is one of many, but it is, has been proven to be helpful because it has resulted in around 80% of correct Parkinson's diagnoses uh, according to um, surveys. The management of Parkinson's disease um, is uh, multifaceted because you have to remember that early onset Parkinson's disease is particularly a, deep, a debilitating condition because the age group in which it occurs has a longer life, life expectancy at onset. So a multicentric management is often necessary focusing on pharmacological, non-pharmacological and lifestyle modifications. Treatment differs from late onset Parkinson's. Late onset Parkinson's uh, you primarily start off with levodopa, carbidopa, and then you add in adjunct treatments. In this um, guideline in early onset Parkinson's disease, um, you uh, can start with levodopa, carbidopa, but some guidelines recommend that you start with a dopamine agonist because levodopa, carbidopa presents with more dyskinesias uh, as compared to late onset patients if you start with um, this therapy. The following guidelines have been um, uh, made from NICE, ANA, and peer-reviewed studies. 
on the next page. So the mainstay should be the mainstay of uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. However, should be that you should control the signs and symptoms for as long as possible while reducing the side effects. And it has to be indiv individualized according to the needs of the patient, keeping in mind social, emotional, and psychological needs of the patient. Cornerstone study identified um, a certain approach while managing early onset Parkinson's disease. Dopamine agonists are recommended in early onset Parkinson's disease, thus delaying onset of levodopa. Levodopa should be added to the therapy if response is unsatisfactory or there's a risk of development of adverse effects. EOPD patients have been shown to be greater can great candidates for DBS with lower incidence of resistant symptoms. Cell-based therapies or, uh, and occupational therapies and exercise are an important adjunct to this therapy. Cell-based therapies are experimental and they offer a new perspective. There's a lot of uh, research still going on in them. Um, but you have to remember at the end of the day, you have to address um, all the different aspects of the disease, not just one aspect. And it includes the psychological stress that uh, is increased in early onset patients and in younger people because they affect the quality of life. Um, management uh, individually, uh, managing the drug according to the different drugs that are present. So you have levodopa, carbidopa, which um, uh, are the mainstay of treatment in older, on uh, late onset disease. Some physicians still prescribe this in early onset disease directly. Some studies show that you should go with dopamine agonists such as pramiprexol and ropirinol in early disease because of the reasons I already mentioned. Um, MOA inhibitors and COMPT inhibitors can be used as adjuncts as well as anticholinergic medications can be useful for tremors. But you have to keep in mind that um, uh, this is not always necessary and dopamine agonists can often manage the tremor symptoms. Um, Prima Venserin is the first medication approved by the FDA for hallucinations and delusions, which are associated with late onset Parkinson's disease. And this is a serotonin inverse agonist. Um, one last and very important modality, which is um, relevant for this demographic, would be a deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation was uh, had its inception back in 1997. And since there has been a lot of research and a lot of um, improvement in the therapy. In around 2016, it was approved for early stage Parkinson's. Um, the way it works is that you insert electrodes into the brain using MRI. Then you do a second procedure to insert an impulse uh, generator or IPG. These impulses are provi this provides impulses to, br uh, to the brain, which are required for motor function, um, particularly the basal ganglia. So um, patients are often given a control switch, which um, enables this to be turned on and off. And there are two different types of um, there are two different types of uh, uh, deep brain stimulation. Both of them have the same prognosis and both of them uh, have been received well by the patients. So there are subthalamic nucleus and globus pallidus internus. Two important studies um, have been done. M multiple others have been done, but two important studies um, uh, showed that deep brain stimulation had great efficacy and even arguably better than best medical therapy, which was levodopa carbidopa for long term prognosis with DPS. This approach would particularly be uh, uh, particularly potentially benefit those with EOPD. One last word on EOPD is that um, the clinical picture is um, slightly different from um, late onset Parkinson's, but along with this, um, you need a more multifaceted approach, especially in these patients, considering the different lifestyle factors and life expectancies of these patients. Um, also, one other thing is that you need to manage these patients in a way where it gives the best possible outcome because they have to ma uh, manage this disease for a longer duration as compared to someone with late onset disease. Um, therapies uh, and modalities, interventions such as deep brain uh, stimulation, which have come into play uh, more recently and have shown to have a greater prognosis, um, better prognosis and long term better prognosis might be um, very relevant in the cases of these patients and show, so sh everything should be considered after you make a diagnosis of EOPD. Thank you very much.